Um, the original idea, and this is often the hardest part of being an entrepreneur, is the original idea. Now in 2000, when the internet was emerging and there wasn't broadband access and wireless and many of the things that we've got today, um, I'd come to the conclusion that video over the internet um, would allow a, a global broadcasting platform to emerge. It was the first time that cable companies, hadn't, cable companies and local media companies hadn't controlled what we watched and when we watched it and how we watched it. That the internet opened up the opportunities where we could broadcast videos all around the world. Um, the plan that we came up with was very much to replicate the TV model. So the traditional TV model is that you can tune into your TV, watch the shows that you want, it's supported by advertising. The four key components to it are content, distribution, advertising, and technology. So what we did was we took that model and then applied it to a global platform. There was four key pillars to the business, which is very much the same as any media company today. One was content. You had to have content. Nobody comes to watch technology. You had to have the technology to distribute this worldwide and the distribution, set up the distribution that you had enough eyeballs or enough people watching the video that you could play advertising and generate revenue around that. One of our big advantages was that we took the whole business model and built a platform to do this worldwide. Uh, we ended up launching websites. This is part of our distribution network. We, we signed up about 400 websites worldwide. They were across Europe and Europe and the UK and the Europe, or throughout the US, some down in South America, some through Asia Pacific. Um, so we had really you know, met our goal of building this large distribution network. We very much supplied the back end, and at the front end, we supplied them with content in their look and feel, etc. The revenue was just like traditional um, advertising solutions where we played ads before the before the um, videos. Now today, you could go onto YouTube or many sites, and this is all just normal. This is all run of the mill. But in 2000, 2001, 2002, this was very groundbreaking and very hard to do because we didn't have the 3G, 4G, and broadband infrastructure in place. I think we're actually one of the first people in the world to actually have a player, uh, a, an ad in front of a video. We had branded players that we did for many big brands, including Ford and General Motors. This particular one pictured here was Orange Music and, and Gillette. And we provided a full management system. So we did this through to, from 2000 through to 2008, and I learned an enormous amount of lessons through building a company through that. Lesson number one that I'd like to share with you, and I'm just going to go through random lessons here, and hopefully this will give you a bit of an insight in what it takes to take it from an idea through to a full company and in, to an extent through to a global company. And some of the lessons that I learnt and still apply today. Um, the definition of an entrepreneur is see a problem equals every person can recognise a problem. See a problem and have a solution, that's often a, a visionary. See a problem, have a solution and act on it is an entrepreneur. So the big thing about the ideas or opportunities or things that you've seen today that is really comes back and, and relates to being an entrepreneur is the fact that you execute on the idea. Um, every idea starts from somewhere and it takes a lot of work. Um, a lot of these ideas are something you stumble across or looking at two products or how a company can do something better or how something can be done better. Um, you know, your idea is your idea, um, and sometimes you know you don't need to get someone's approval to feel that that is an idea. Henry Ford had it here, and I think Steve Jobs mentioned it. Um, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have asked for faster horses. So he did very little research. He just said that people are going like, to like an affordable car. Um, the, the advice that I'd offer is don't. Don't let people tell you your idea isn't work, won't work. That's got to be your conclusion and come from doing research, etc., um, around it. So there's been plenty of ideas that I've had. I think the video one, when I started that in 2000, I had you know, many friends, family, investors, everybody endlessly told me that no one's ever going to watch video over the internet. 
but I didn't listen to them. And I think that that's really where it all starts. You've got to sit there once you've got your idea or opportunity that you want to take to market or product that you want to build, you've got to do your own research and draw your own conclusions. And if after that you feel it's an idea, then you start the process of building, building from there. But with a lot of my ideas, it's really been sit down and research everything. What I did with the video business was I read every media book there was. So anybody that had ever put out a media book, whether it was the story of Sony or Ted Turner's story who started CNN, I read those books and le learned as much as I could about the media industry so I could adopt the concepts within that to it. Um, the second thing is plan and pl play long. Focus on winning the war, not the battle. With a lot of products and ideas and solutions, they can be a short-term solution. Um, they don't have many barriers to entry, so other people can copy your solution, etc. But I've always very much focused on building, building, it's like almost building a family company or thinking long-term. So I always sat there and laid out where I thought the technology was going and how could we plan for that now. Quite often with some ideas, you can have the idea very, very early and before the market's ready to go. Um, what I used to do is sit down and plan out the next five years on where I thought that product would be. And that wasn't a sophisticated plan. It would be sometimes just sitting in a park and going through, right, year one, this is going to happen, year two, this is going to happen, year three, this is going to happen. Um, two examples I've got here of things that are just emerging now are Google Glasses and TV apps. So having apps on your TV similar to what you have on your phone today. They're two trends that have just started now, but if your product has anything to do with those areas, it's how do you incorporate your product into these things that are, things that are um, uh, emerging. Um, second lesson that I've learned is don't have a plan B. If you, once you've got an idea and you've set the direction on where you want to go, um, you must be totally committed to that direction. This is a great picture here of a surfer. Now he can't have a plan B. He's fully committed to surfing that particular wage, wave um, and there's no out. And that's how you must be with your idea. Um, especially when you're dealing in markets that are far more mature like um, the US and in particular New York. If, you know, people will sense when you're not committed to your idea. So you must be 100% committed to it. Um, I'm often asked, what happens if the idea doesn't work? And I just say, it's not an option. We're just going to keep working at this until it's a success. And that's the attitude you've got to be. If you, if you have a plan B, you'll start thinking about it. People will sense it in you, and they'll have doubt in your commitment to it. Third thing, no exit strategy. At the time when you start building the company or building the plan, build for long term. Build for something that you might want to pass on to your kids or something like that. Too often I sit down with entrepreneurs or people that are building products and their exit strategy is to sell to Google or Yahoo or Microsoft or something like that. Often what I end up seeing is that they're, that they're planning their business around their exit strategy and often they, they close up shop and go broke before they actually get to their exit strategy. So don't plan for an exit strategy. Just plan to build a great company and great business and continue to bring in new products. Investors, often when investors invest in your business, they'll require you to have an exit plan. So you'll need to have an answer for that question, whether it's potentially sell to somebody or potentially go public in a particular market. But don't plan for that up at the front. From you personally, build you know, your business if it's long term. Products win. You must be passionate about your product and love your product. If there's anything that's emerging over the last few years, it's the leaders within the industry are the ones that are fully committed to their product. Um, the guys that I work with, they, they know that that's where I'd like to be, that's like where I like to spend all my time, and I love building the product. I absolutely love it. Um, and you must be focused on that, and very, very much user-focused. Everything that you do around your product should be led by the users. Fail. Entrepreneurs, you know, a study came out that said entrepreneurs fail 19 times a day. You must build a con 
culture, and especially within this environment now where we've got things like agile development, where every week you can release new features and, and functionality on whatever your product is, you've really got to build a culture within your organization that's okay to fail. It's okay to fail because if they're not failing, they're not trying new things. And with so many new things being introduced into the market now, it's really important that you're trying things every day. The way that we work is we release a product or enhancements to our product every week. And often that's got lots of new features. Now, if those features fail, that's fine. The next week we can wind them back or we can improve them. Learn from your failures, but please you know, encourage your staff and everybody within it to try new things all the time. Going global, the businesses that I've traditionally been involved with have been across lots of different markets. Um, and very early on in your piece, when you come up with your idea and are setting your plan, if your aim is to go global, it's a lot easier if you start knowing that in advance. Um, it, it, it helps if you pick people that have traveled extensively before. Um, it helps if you're picking a, building a multicultural organization where you've got people from different countries with different interests, etc., cetera, within, that, within lots of different markets. I've been very, very lucky that I've had the opportunity to um, work in many places around the world and in many countries around the world. And I've learned a lot from it. Probably the biggest one is the next point, is that be global, but act, act local. Is that when, as I am today, a visitor in Colombia, that's the way you've got to act in any market that you plan to go into. That you're a visitor in their, mar your, their market. Don't try and walk into those markets and push your way of doing business or your thing onto it. Recognize that when you're in those markets, you're a guest in those markets. Um, I've, one thing that we've found very, very helpful and we always live by now is local staff and partners in each market. They're the ones that have got the networks and the expertise and everything like this. The other thing is, don't underestimate local, local competitors. When you walk into a new global or a new country to start operating, understand the landscape very, very well because some of the local competitors can be very entrenched in the market and be very, very hard to compete against. Um, we're seeing the whole digital landscape changing now where Google, Microsoft, Facebook, all of these co companies that would largely have very, very large user bases in the US every day their, U their US user base is decreasing as the rest of the world is starting to expand, especially in exciting markets like here, India, um, and China. Uh, people make companies. Um, it's very, very important that part of this process is to, to bring your idea to market. There's, there's two things you're gonna need for sure. You're gonna need great people and lots of them most of the time. Second thing is you're gonna need the money to go in, the money to fund the company through this process. Um, it's important you build a champion team, a team that works together, that gets along well together, and don't focus so much on pulling in individuals that have been champions somewhere else. An example of that would be, you know, so often I see a company and they say, yeah, we've got people from Google in the company, and we've got people from Microsoft in the company. Often those two people don't get along because they come from completely different cultures. So it's very, very important that the team gets along and works as a team. Look for people that have done this before, people that have had the experience to grow a business, grow a business quickly. I often look for people that have got both corporate experience plus startup experience. The reason for that is, is that through the startup phase, you've, you try and make sure that these people can continue to grow with the business. In a startup that might have 10 people in it, you want to try and pick people that can take the business to 100, 200, 300 people. It's very, very important. And the corporate side also gives brings some process and operations to the business that often make it more efficient. Businesses are very easy to run when there's five or 10 people in all, all in one room. When there's 100 or 200 people spread out around the world, it, there's a lot more challenges involved. Always check the basic skills of anybody that's coming to work in the business. Can they do use PowerPoint? Can they do their own PowerPoints? Can they use Excel? Just basic skills. Too often, you know, you've been caught where someone's very gifted, but actually have their computer skills aren't that well. Surround yourself with smart people who complement your skills. 
If you have weaknesses, we all have weaknesses in certain areas, surround yourself with people that are strong, you know, that counterbalance your weaknesses. Um, best people in the best markets, in the biggest markets. In, you know, too often I see I live in the US now and have for many, you know, for 14, 15 years now. What I see is that so many companies enter into the US from overseas but send in their second or third tier people. It's, it's you know, the, the example I give, you wouldn't send your B team to the World Cup. When you're going into the big mature markets where competition is going to be intense, it's very important that your senior people and your best people are put into those markets. Build a dynamic, interactive, focused teams. Traditional st structures you see on a flow chart where they're lines and this person's head of something and has a whole line of people um, reporting to them, they're often inefficient. And especially in fast moving, moving markets, um, <coughs> it's very important that you've got tight teams that interact with each other and, and can dynamically interact with each other. Management team. Building a business is really, really hard work. It starts with the idea, but it's really, really hard after that. And it's long and it's tiring. Um, if it's international, it means you're spending a lot of time on planes, you're going without sleep. Um, don't be misled that it's fun the whole journey. It is, I find it fun the whole journey, but there's going to be plenty of times when you're going to be very tired and have to keep going. You'll need to be resilient. If your idea is new and exciting, there'll be big, probably be big barriers to implementing that particular idea. You'll need to be a road war warrior if, if it's um, global. You know, I'm virtually in a separate country or separate place every week, if not every two weeks, um, going somewhere else into different markets, and that's mainly because the, the things that I'm doing now are global. Remain positive. You've got to remain positive all the way, what time that this will get through and be prepared to make some personal sacrifices. It's very, very hard, and, but you'll miss a couple of birthdays and you'll miss a couple of events because you will be traveling. Um, financing investment. It's a necessary part of uh, bringing any idea to market. It's probably the hardest thing anybody will do in a new startup business. Um, it requires, you know, you have to be so resilient, it's not funny. You, you sit in front of a lot of people that say no, that will say that your ideas won't work, etc. Um, so you have to be prepared for this, and if you, especially if you're the CEO or CFO of a, a small startup company, you must be prepared for the journey that that's going to take. Manage your investors, listen to their ideas and advice, um, but put your customers first. Often they may want you to do something that doesn't fit within your business. Don't build your, build your business for investors, build it for your users. Um, it takes a lot of time, so prepare a lot in advance. Prepare your presentations, your questions, and all your documentation for investment prior to entering the market. And preferred funding is always strategic funding. Funding that can potentially bring a strategic partner that can potentially, potentially accelerate the growth of your business. How to scale your business. Um, where possible, use automated revenue. Um, where someone can pay with a credit card, etc. It scales very, very well. I know that's very, very hard for lots of uh, businesses out there, especially service-based businesses. In a service-based business, the only advice I'd probably give is try and get cash up front so the cash flow doesn't cause any problems. Don't be scared of big comp comp competitors. They may be big and established, etc. Often i found if you're competing against them, you've just got to move faster, be more innovative, and understand their strengths, but also their weaknesses. But the key really is the speed at which you move at. It makes them, it harder for them to copy you. And also be very, very innovative so you're moving quicker than them. Execute. The best advice I could give you with a new idea is to execute on it. A lot of the times very early when you're just telling somebody about the idea, they won't accept it. They'll tell you it's not going to work. There's lots of things going on there. Just, just execute. If every week they're seeing you make progress, that's the best way to prove them wrong. Don't waste time on arguing with non-believers. Um, celebrate your wins. There's nothing greater than momentum in a business. It, it, it helps your staffs, your investors, 
um, your users, everybody likes momentum. So really build the momentum and move things fast and then celebrate when you do have wins. Understand emerging technologies. These are four basic ones that you've probably read and heard and seen lots about this week and there's probably another 50 that you could add to this list. Um, but it's very important to understand and see what's coming. Sometimes you have to wait for that product to develop a bit. Sometimes um, it's, uh, it's not suitable, doesn't fit with your current product. But it's very important, especially in today's world, to understand the trends that are emerging and coming along. Mobile, uh, I just want to spend a moment on this because the growth on mobile has been just absolutely you know, st uh, staggering the last few years. But it's really been in the last probably six months that we're really seeing that taking over from the desktop. Um, our, our philosophy is now, and we're to the pro project that we've been working on, we've just making a lot of changes now, but really looking at the mobile phone first, because it's an internet-based product, a mobile phone first, leading back to the desktop, but not designing separately for each product, but really look, focusing purely on the mobile phone and through to the desktop. Finance and legal, this is basic information, but it's important. Keep your corporate information up to date. Keep all your books and finances and accounting up to date and manage your cash flows. They're very, very basic things, but you never know when a potential investor or acquirer or major partner is going to want to view these documents. And if they aren't prepared and up to date, it'll only make you look disorganized and create more doubt in their mind. Latin America, um, I think this is, this is my sixth trip in the last six months to Colombia. I've also been in Brazil, Mexico, Panama. I think this is such an exciting region at the moment, and such a high growth region at the moment. Um, I see a whole lot of opportunities here. Mobile penetration is high. The technical knowledge and, and expertise is expanding every day. And the exposure to the market through events such as the Olympics and the World Cup make it a very, very exciting place to understand. I'm continually telling my friends back in the US that know that I'm coming down here. Often they're looking at statistics and trends and reading reports on what's happening in the markets down here. But my response to them is, just get on a plane and go down there. Just see it. You've got to get a feel for the excitement and the enthusiasm and the opportunities. Uh, I, I'm just going to start and finish off now with a project that we've been working on for a few months. I'm just going to play you a, a short video on our new project. Sport 195, the global social network for sports. Our mission is to empower and unite people globally through sports. The Sport 195 platform brings together fans, athletes, and organizations from over 195 countries, covering over 300 sports at all levels from professional down to your local youth club team, all in one place. As the world's first social network devoted to sports, Sport 195 allows users to follow what they want, when they want, providing our users with an online community customized to their interests. Sport 195 is built on three pillars. The first pillar is for the fan. We provide one platform for the fan to follow all of their sports interests, allowing them to engage with the content and other users through the sharing of images, videos, and comments. The second pillar provides athletes of all levels an ability to create a sports profile to track their athletic participation and achievements over time and connect with family, friends, and fans to keep them updated in real time. The third pillar is providing a sports infrastructure solution for organizations to manage all of their sports within one environment, enabling organizations of all types and sizes across the world to have an online community specific to sports, fostering a greater relationship with their athletes and fans of all ages and skills. Join Sport195 now to get the most comprehensive experience around sports in the world. And join our mission to empower and connect the world through sports at sport195.com. So this is the latest idea or project that I've been working on the last three years now, actually. Very, very simple idea. One day I was sitting on the couch and I went to see what was happening in the English Premier League soccer. I then went to see my local football team down in Australia. Then went to check what was happening in the Formula One. 
and down to what time my daughter was playing soccer that particular day, or football that particular day. And the idea was, I sat there and I thought, this is crazy. I'm going to five or six different websites to get my sporting information. And I thought, it should be that I should be able to put in what teams I want to follow, and all that information comes to me. So that was the idea. The next stage from that is we spent a lot of time researching sports around the world and came to the conclusion in most markets, the large media companies ran the sports for that particular market. So in Colombia, it'd be one of the large media companies and they were controlling and, and really focusing on the leagues through within that market. But nothing was connected worldwide. So the market was very, very fragmented. Um, our mission now, it's to empower and unite people globally through sports. There's roughly 7 billion people in the world, 43% of them are under 25, and there's only two things that really unite those people under 25, and that is sport and music. So our aim is to unite people globally through sports. Setting up the strategy, so once we'd come up with the idea, we the, the core plan was that we wanted to build a, a digital platform for all sports around the world. So for 300 sports around the world. Then have it for all countries around the world, so 195 countries around the world. So hence the name of the project is Sport 195. And we wanted it for all levels, whether it was professional, high school or club within the platform. So for those of you that understand data, that is an enormous platform and it's bigger than anybody's ever done in sports in the past. So we knew very, very early that this was a very, very large project. And then the aim was to collect all this data from around the world and connect it through all the traditional social media tools. So the site isn't up yet. We're, we've got a, a rough test site up at the moment. We'll launch the full site in probably six to eight weeks time. But already, if you look up the top, it's been an enormous data project. So we're covering 195 countries. We're covering over 335 teams. Over 2.5 million athletes are in the system. Over 600,000 events and over 250,000 schools. So part of this is we've built a, a very, very, probably the world's largest database of sports data even before we start. The three pillars to the business, as we said, was just the average fan that wants to go in and can pick what teams they want to follow, what athletes they want to follow, what um, leagues they want to follow, what sports they want to follow, and they get fed a feed of results, scores, um, news, videos, images and everything on those particular things. The second pillar is an athlete at any level from anywhere around the world, whether they live in Spain, Africa, the US, Colombia, Mexico, can go in and build their own sports profile, which is very much like your LinkedIn profile. So you can sit there and say, these are the sports I play, these are the teams I play for, the clubs I'm associated with, etc. What this allows you to do is really showcase your sporting resume, so coaches, friends, families, and everybody can keep track of your results and everything to do with that. The fourth pillar, the third pillar of the business is for the organisation. As the world's expanding very, very quickly, especially in markets like Latin America and in India, etc., the teams and the schools and the leagues need the tools to be able to manage their leagues or schools or teams. So the local club football league can go and put all their teams in, all their athletes in, their scores, their results, their standings and everything, and do all of that for free on the platform. So they can do all of that for free and manage it completely. The same with the school. It's to provide the tool sets that doesn't matter what sport you're playing or where you're based in the world, all the tools to be able to manage that organisation. The third is to socialise and, and, and interact. And this is very much all the features that you'd find on whether it was a Facebook or a LinkedIn or Twitter to an extent where you can follow friends, follow athletes, follow teams, etc. You can upload pictures, video, like things, comment on things. So all the traditional social media, media pieces on top. Where we are today, 
it's a, with the project, it's a global idea and has global appeal. So I want to take many of the things that I've spoken about earlier on advice, this is what we've implemented. The technology, we're using big data, responsive designs that are just regardless of, of device. We've got strategic regional partners. We've got people that have done this before. We have an automated revenue stream. We compete against major media companies. We love and use our product and work to make it better every day. We'll be launching soon. We've got offices in New York, Boston, India. In, in India, we've got two offices down there, one in Hyderabad and one in Mumbai. We've set up an office in Mexico, Australia, and we've just opened one down here in Bogota. We're about 120 people now, and we're going to 500 people um, by the end of the year. So this is still an idea, and the platform hasn't launched yet. But this gives you an idea that we knew how big it was from the start. But it still just started as an idea you know, three or four years ago. The revenue model for the business will be naturally advertising, and also an opportunity where, whether it's a school or league, etc., can upgrade the features that they use, and they get more advanced the features for a different, um, different area. The platform's built to cover whether it's professional, club, league, team. So it's all a very, very wide range. So why I, th I think anything's possible in the new digital world is really the tools and opportunities are there. Um, you guys are at the forefront of it. A good idea. It's easy to get it, far easy to get traction and build it out from there from now on. This is a key slide to me that we need to understand that it's just beginning. This is the early stages. There's only 2.4 million of the of 2.4 billion of the world's 7.1 billion people actually have internet access. So we're really at the infancy stage of where the opportunities lie. In summary, the market's growing every day globally. There's plenty of opportunities. Um, a, bi a global business can be built from anywhere in the world. You don't have to be sitting in Silicon Valley anymore. You can be anywhere in the world. The transition of the primary device being the computer to the primary device being the mobile phone creates a, a lot of opportunities because many of your competitors may not be ready for that. And if you move quickly, you can beat them into the market. And investors are becoming far more in involved with and familiar with uh, um, technology. Um, I'm sorry I've had to move quite quick today, and I'm very sorry I'm speaking in English as my Espanol is not, not very good, and you wouldn't have understood what I was saying. Um, I hope some of the points that I've brought up here help you with developing your ideas, your opportunities, and everything in the future. So thank you. Shut it down.